Yeah, the BBC. Uh, one of their hosts, a guy called David Aranovich, uh, he hosts a BBC radio show called uh, The Briefing Room. And uh, he tweeted uh, that Donald Trump, that uh, Joe, Joe Biden should murder Donald Trump, which would be one way, I suppose, to get him out of the way in terms of the election. Uh, he insists that tweet was satire but deleted it. Uh, the point is, is first of all, uh, surely uh, that kind of infringes, there it is, if I was Biden, I'd hurry up and have Trump murdered on the basis that he is a threat to America's security. Uh, well, that surely breaks BBC impartiality rules and also maybe breaks their taste rules. It's a bit sort of out there, isn't it? And... Uh, Basically, uh, the BBC have failed to respond about this. People, big story in the sun saying what's going on. Typical BBC, you know, ostrich like her head in the sand, won't respond. Uh, they need to respond about this, don't they? Let's talk to uh, campaign director at Defund the BBC, Rebecca Ryan. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Kevin. Uh, well, you uh, you know the, the the details of this story. David Aranovich, a BBC host, saying uh, if I was. Uh, Joe Biden, I'll get on with murdering Donald Trump. Uh, he deleted that post pretty quickly. He said there'd been a pile-on from the far right. The far right. He, he seems to think that only the far right would be offended by that tweet. He says it's satire. But uh, the point is, The Sun ran this uh, as a, quite a big story. And the BBC have failed to respond. I mean, they owe us an explanation. Does this not break impartiality rules? Shows a bit of favouritism towards one side, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, it's absolutely outrageous that this the British licence fee payers are forced to pay this guy's salary. You know, when we've had in recent memory, we've had the murder of Joe Cox, we've had the murder of David Amos. This is a thing, this, you know, these kind of threats in politics, it's not just sort of like some fanciful thing. You know, it, it's a reality. It's been a reality in this country. And just imagine if this was somebody who wasn't sort of... Um, a centrist, if someone slightly to the right who'd said this, they would have been cancelled. The BBC would be up in arms um, and they would have been sort of ushered out of whatever role they were in. Yeah. Um, the, the complete hypocrisy of the reaction to this um, is just stunning, isn't it? As you say, absolute radio silence from the BBC and everybody, you know, all the sort of loudmouths on Twitter, just sort of nothing to say about this. Whereas if it had been somebody else, they would be, they'd be yeah. absolutely outrage. You're absolutely right. If uh, Aranovich, uh, former Times columnist, by the way, uh, if he had tweeted, uh, gee, I, you know, I hope the brilliant Donald Trump beats that left-wing old geezer Joe Biden, uh, the BBC would have him out the door within seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I mean, they just they just wouldn't even dare to say it, would they? But it's just it's just so shocking how they have this double standard, and that he can just. He can just say, oh, well, it's obviously just satire and this was a, you know, a far right file on. And just that they have no self-awareness. And I think that's the sh thing that is so shocking because the average British person, they can see this, what it is, which is complete double standards. When, you know, when you get some people who are on the right who say things that aren't great and, th and they shouldn't do, they are, you know, they are ushered out of their jobs. You know, they're cancelled from, from all media, you know, never to be heard from again. But when it's somebody like him, he can just go, oh, you know, it's a bunch of far right people making a fuss and it's clearly a joke. Typical, um, typical left winger, you know, who, mm. who, who actually tweets something that a lot of people could find offensive. Uh, yeah. And that he interprets the people who point out that it's a very offensive thing to tweet. Uh, they must be far right. No, no, no. <laughs> what they are, David, is human beings uh, with a sense of decency. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. Exactly. Well, this is the thing, is, isn't it? They, they get very excited about sort of the, the um, whatever they like to call the far right and this sort of danger and extremism on Twitter. And they're, they're always sort of digging up into these stories about this extremist element. And yet they can say these things and sort of, oh, well, it's, it's clearly a joke. So it's, it's fine for one uh, part of society to make really horrible jokes about people. Um, but it's not OK for the others. And that's not OK when you are you're, his salary is paid for by the British people. You know, we're forced to pay for it if we watch any live broadcast TV. And that's just not fair. And that's not the standard that they should be held to. Uh, what well, this is this happened during the Gary Lineker saga uh, when uh, I think it was when he, he was perceived to have 
broken the tweeting or the social media rules for the second time. And uh, all the papers and all the journalists going, oh, what's your response to the BBC? And they just didn't respond. Uh, and I remember that uh, the Director General, Tim Allen, was chased down actually by Talk TV, the previous incarnation of Talk, outside Broadcasting House in central London. And he just sort of said, oh, you'd have to talk to the press office. Maybe, but the press office weren't saying anything. It's a new way of dealing with uh, negative press, as far as the BBC is concerned. Uh, they just don't respond. You know, well, we pay our licence fee. I, I, I require an explanation as to what is going to happen to this guy. Is he going to get punished? Is he going to yeah. get talked to? Is he going to get told not to tweet this kind of thing again? Uh, is he going to get sacked or anything? But to, yeah. just to not respond at all is very strange. It is, but it's no, they know the complete power that they have. They have like a monopoly over the news cycle, don't they, the BBC? And they know that if they say something, because of the way they have kind of enforced this ownership, and they, they, they know that if they just keep quiet, the story just disappears. You know, and a lot, a large amount of people won't hear it. You know, obviously you get the Daily Mail readers, we get talk TV viewers, we get GB News and what have you. They're, they all see it. But the BBC, if they just quash a story, then it, it just doesn't come to be for a large percentage of the of the population. Um, and yet, as you say, this is just a, a tactic that we see them uh, roll out time and time again. And it's, it's not acceptable to pick and choose what's news. Um, when you are funded by licence fee payers. That's not what the BBC is about. That's not the obligation that they have with their with their charter. The charter obliges them to deliver journalistic excellence, which means reporting on the news impartially. And they are in breach of that contract um, on a very regular basis. Yeah, indeed. Uh, going out to the other famous BBC tweeter, Gary Lineker. Uh, he's out there obviously covering the Euros in Germany. Uh, he's doing quite a good job, actually. Uh, when, he, when he actually does his job, uh, being a sports presenter, he's not half bad. Uh, but uh, on the side, he does this podcast, a private podcast, called um, uh, The Rest is Football. And uh, I read a story saying that he's earning like 125 grand a week from it or something while the Euros are on. I mean, he's got a right to do that, uh, you know, private enterprise and all that. And I don't want to stand in the way of people uh, making good money. Good for him. Uh, well, I say good for him, but there's something that's uncomfortable about this. You know, a guy who earns £1.3 million a year from the BBC, the state broadcaster, our money, licence fee, <laughs> payers money they also got this big sideline that is basically being boosted by yeah. the job he does for the bbc uh yeah. i mean as again there's nothing to stop him doing this but uh, i find it slightly uncomfortable absolutely and this is the thing that bbc uh, presenters and staff say time and time again when whenever they sort of get themselves into muddy waters they always come out with this well you know with we are individuals you know the carol borderman came out with i'm just an individual i can it should be free to say whatever i like all over social media but as you say there these people are being given a platform by license fee payers you know who are obliged you know who have to pay for the license fee if they watch any live broadcast tv so they're given this huge platform which raises their profile and then you've got bbc um so-called talent you know tapping in a little bit of extra money on the side as they do time and again with this sort of speaking engagements podcasts and what have you on the side and yet as you say it's uncomfortable i think people would have less of a problem if it would if people were in their um in the context of working for the BBC they actually were impartial you know and, and when they were on social media and what have you if they thought that these people were truly impartial they wouldn't feel so bad about them getting a bit of money on the side but when they've got this additional platform that they're kind of um milking um which is you know been provided by British license fee payers then it just makes you feel you know it's a bit grubby isn't it yeah, and uh, again, you know, I wouldn't want to, I don't want like to stand in the way of uh, personal enterprise, and this is enterprising of him. But uh, you know, he's been quite controversial through this tournament. Good for him in a way, but you just sort of suspect that maybe he, you know, bumps up his performance, decides to say something in order to hit the headlines, so that more people can uh, tune into his podcast. As I say, in the first week of the tournament, uh, he earned 125,000 quid from this uh, podcast, or was it the first two weeks? But anyway, huge amount of money uh, uh, that, that is really on the back of 
at what he's doing for the state broadcaster, which is uh, commentating and punditry on this tournament. So, you know, again, it, it's it's not quite right. It doesn't seem quite right to me. Yeah, and it's brazen, as we spoke about, I think, fairly recently, where he wore one of his tops from his, his fashion yeah. on, the, on the program and quickly had to sort of be told that, no, he couldn't. For once they told him, or at least he decided he wasn't going to wear that again. But it's a similar thing. He knows how to play the press, doesn't he? He knows how to get the, an additional bit of cash here and there. You know, he's a bit of a wheeler dealer character, isn't he? And he's a bit shameless. And I think that just, like you say, it makes people just feel a bit uncomfortable with the fact that we're paying him 1.35 million um, to, you know, talk about football. Yeah, he's got an incredible, incredibly successful podcast company, uh, which produces all sorts of podcasts. I think one of them is the uh, Alistair uh, Campbell Rory Stewart uh, podcast, which is amazingly successful. Those two earn a fortune from it. And uh, no doubt Mr Lineker takes his uh, cut, which he's perfectly entitled to do. Good business sense he's got. There's no doubt about that. Uh, on a general basis, before we uh, part company, uh, Rebecca, great talking to you as always. Uh, going forward, uh, a Labour government, how will that be for the BBC? It's kind of good news, isn't it? I mean, let's face it, the Tories were always terrified of the Beeb. They were te they mistake they mistakenly believed that, that everybody loves Auntie Beeb. So they weren't particularly tough on uh, cutting back on the Beeb or proceeding towards what should happen, that is the cancellation of the licence fee. Uh, but uh, with Labour, the licence fee will be here to stay, won't it? Well, I think the thing is, I think, I think the BBC probably is rubbing its hands together and hoping that's the case. They certainly seem very gleeful on their on their news reportage. Um, so, you know, I imagine that they think so. But, you know, coming down the line is a major problem for the BBC, which is that young people just don't watch live broadcast TV. Um, and older people who currently prop up the BBC, but are learning more and more that they don't have to pay for it, um, you know, are... Um, getting older and so there is this this it's coming down the line that people will not be funding the BBC in the way that they're used to now the things that we've got to look out for is if Labour Party decides that they want to put the license fee into general taxation and that's something that they potentially will try and do because they know that the license fee is unpopular they know also that it's what they would call regressive because you know everybody pays the same amount so it's in their view not fair for poorer people but also it's discriminatory 74 percent of people who are discriminated for not paying the tv license are women and that's just simply because of the methodology of of, of prosecuting this is because women are more likely to be at home it's, it's not in one person's name it's in the household so whoever opens the door gets prosecuted um, so they know that these things are problematic. And yeah, the big concern is that they say, well, OK, to remove this problem, what we'll do is we'll just put it into general taxation, which means that richer people will pay more for it um, and poor people will pay less for it. But at the end of the day, that doesn't deal with the issues for the BBC, which is that it's hugely wasteful and it will still be churning out this diatribe of wokeism and just annoying people. So I think if they try to do that, they will see a real pushback, I think, and the Labour Party will, will probably come up across major issues with that. Yeah, uh, it should be interesting. Uh, Rebecca, brilliant to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time. Rebecca Ryan, their campaign director at Defund the BBC. Should we defund the BBC? Do you want to pay the licence fee uh, anymore? Going to have to for a while, 170 quid a year. Is it value for money? Why do we have to pay it? It's just ridiculous. It's anachronistic, you know, compulsory by law. Uh, if you don't pay this, you won't be able to watch Strictly Come Dancing. What? And if you don't pay it, you might go to prison. Hey, it's just a dancing show.